Why did I buy this? It was $30 at the thrift store. It's just about the most bare-bones Sony cassette deck I've ever seen. And it doesn't work. It's gonna at least need new belts because I tried it out at the store and none of the functions worked. I guess part of it is just the novelty of having such a low-end Sony. It's kind of like having a Mercedes with a manual instead of a Ford with all the frills. You don't often see a Sony cassette deck with completely mechanical piano key controls and manual tape type selection and a mechanical tape counter. The only things that really separate this from some of the cheap cassette decks you can buy today are the ability to record on metal tapes and Dolby B and C noise reduction. And because this uses such a simple mechanism, that should make replacing the belts a lot easier than one of the fancier decks with auto reverse and a full logic mechanism. Because very often with these Sony decks, especially from the 90s for some reason, the belts don't just stretch or snap. They melt into a sticky goo that is very messy and time consuming to clean out. I don't know if it's because they switched from natural rubber to synthetic rubber, or they started using some kind of different vulcanization method for the belts, but these Sony decks from the 90s are more likely to have bad belts than many other decks from the 80s, even though they're a decade newer. For example, you may remember this TIAC deck I got a couple months ago. It's from 1987 and it's in perfect working condition. I didn't need to do any repairs to it and I paid half the price for it compared to the Sony. The one advantage of getting a Sony is that you're most likely to find all the information and parts you need to restore them. I typed in that model number TCW365 and within seconds I found a free download for the official Sony service manual for it and a company in California called West Coast Belts which was selling a belt kit for it for $15 with free shipping. And yeah, you can get one of those generic assortments of cassette deck belts for about half the price, but with those, you're not guaranteed to get exactly the sizes you need, and you always end up with a lot of odd sizes that you'll never use in any cassette decks. So when it's available, I prefer to get a belt kit that's specific to the deck I'm working on. And otherwise, this deck is in very good condition. Just has a little bit of sticker residue on this side. And there's the date code. That 5 is the last digit of the year, so in this case it's 1995. And I've never seen any official confirmation of this, but the letter, I've only seen them A through D. So my best guess is that indicates which quarter of the year it was made in. So this will be the fourth quarter of 1995. And just to show you, when I turn it on, the light comes on, but when I put in a tape and try any of the controls, there is no movement of that tape. It doesn't fast forward or rewind, it doesn't play. I can hear the motor running when I put my ear up to it, but it's not doing anything in either of the decks. Removing the cover reveals how lucky I am because not only does this deck have a very simple mechanism, but you can see the belts have started to go loose, but they have not completely turned to goo, which is a very good sign that we may not even have to do any cleaning up here. We just have to take off these old belts and put on new ones. And that makes the job a lot easier than if these had melted. Actually, there is one belt that did break. That's for the tape counter, but that's not important. So yeah, that, that one is turning to goo. But that's the least important one and probably should be the easiest to clean up. Same thing with the deck on the other side. The belts have gone loose but they have not completely melted yet, so we should be good to go with replacing these easily. To gain access to the mechanisms, you do need to remove the doors, which just pop off easily, and the front panel, which is fairly easy. There's three screws on the bottom, but annoyingly, there's one screw that's very difficult to get access to from back here. I needed a very small screwdriver to fit in that space to get it out. But once I did and I unplugged these cables, the whole front panel just came off easily. Now we can see that tape counter belt, which did start to melt, but thankfully not too bad. It looks like it didn't really get stuck that much to the gear here. So may not need to do that much cleaning up of black sticky goo. There, it's unstuck. And just need to get this out of here. Yeah, isn't that lovely? I got a little bit more work than I anticipated when I removed this 
pulley to clean off the belt residue better. It did come out fairly easily, but it also popped out this worm gear that runs the tape counter. Luckily it was easy to take this out and I think I should be able to get back together when I'm done. And one little gotcha is that in order to take off the belt from the motor, you need to remove the motor and it screws in with these two screws in the front, which are a little bit tricky to get to and they're fairly deeply recessed, but if you're lucky like I was, they'll stay in place when you unscrew the motor. So that makes it easier to put them back in. And I opened up that belt kit envelope and it looks like all the belts are the same size and thickness. So that makes installing them a lot easier. There's no question of which one goes where. Another trick is that you need to put the belt on the motor pulley before you reinstall the motor. Otherwise there's not enough clearance to get it on there. Yay, I was able to get the tape counter reassembled and working. I wasn't able to remove all of the belt goo from the pulley but since it's only the tape counter it doesn't really matter actually i just noticed a problem with the belt kit i purchased here you can see i put on the two new belts for this mechanism they both seem to fit and work fine both have good tension seem to be perfectly the right size but you may have noticed when I showed the belts at first, there was only four of them, and there's supposed to be five. Two for each mechanism and one for that tape counter. So I looked back in the bag to make sure I didn't leave one behind, and sure enough I did, but it was this. This little dinky thing. I guess this is supposed to be for the tape counter, but it's not nearly long enough for that. So clearly they gave me the wrong belt for the tape counter. So this is one case where I'm glad I did buy one of those random assortment of belts. I should have one that should be good enough for running the tape counter. It's not a critical size. This is where the service manual comes in handy because it lists the Sony part numbers for all the belts. And you can look them up on this cross-reference chart and find out the industry standard part number for those belts. And then you can buy exactly the belts you need even if a belt kit isn't available for your particular model. Or in my case if it comes with an incorrect belt. And just a quick update on the belts. I called West Coast Belts and I spoke to Brent and I explained my situation to him. And they're going to send me the correct belt for the tape counter. And I also verified with him the proper sizes of all the belts in this deck. So from now on, anyone who orders the belt kit for it from them should not have the same problem that I did. While I still have this thing apart, I took the opportunity to clean the heads and cap stands and pinch rollers. And if you want to talk about cassette decks getting cheapened out over time, I wouldn't blame Tan in because as cheap as their mechanisms were they were always based on a metal frame while it seems like Sony's mechanisms especially in the 90s were made from as much plastic as possible at least in this one the head is still held in place with screws whereas I've seen in many of their boom boxes the heads are mounted on plastic pegs which means the azimuth is non-adjustable but on this one you can turn this screw to adjust the azimuth and it uses genuine Mabuchi motors there's where that hard to reach screw was and I'm not going to bother putting it back in because the front panel is held in place perfectly fine without it now that I have it at least somewhat back together it's time for a basic operational test put in my tape It is playing, we're getting a level indication on the meter. Fast forward, rewind. There's no auto stop on the rewind. Jeez, how cheap can you make this mechanism, Sony? I assume it's not gonna auto stop on fast forward either. Yep, let's test this side. I heard that same kind of clickety clackety sound on the other deck. I thought maybe it had to chip the gear, but now I'm thinking that's just the noise of this cheap plastic mechanism. Oh, that sounds lovely. That's what we get, Sony, for making an entirely plastic mechanism. And again, no auto stop on rewind. Let's see if it at least auto stops on play. It does. 
And if you want some real fun, here's what happens when you put it in high speed dubbing mode. You get plastic gear rattling in stereo. This is starting to feel less like a Mercedes 240D and more like a Lada Shiguli. But before I totally trash this thing, maybe it will redeem itself with its sound quality. So I thought it would be appropriate to try it out with this non-Sony licensed Indonesian bootleg Walkman Fever cassette. And I'll play a song by a group called Cassette. It's Whatcha Gonna Do. It's a catchy little disco tune and it's obscure enough that it doesn't generate any copyright claims. And you can tell this was a bootleg because it was dubbed from vinyl. You can hear the scratches. Now for a recording test, here's a track I copied from CD to Sony XR Metal Type 4 cassette using Dolby C noise reduction. It's called Competitive Spirit. Well, it certainly has been an interesting journey with this cassette deck. I paid what I knew was too much for a very low-end deck. I barely averted a big mess to clean up by catching it just before the belts turned into sticky goo. And my expectations were definitely on the low side when I discovered it's cheap clackety all plastic mechanisms that don't even have full auto stop. But this thing has really surprised me of its sound quality, both on playback and recording. So I guess despite cutting corners everywhere they could in this thing's design and manufacture, Sony still managed to keep what matters most most, and that's how it sounds.